Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be presenting about our work on thermometer continuation. This joint work with Gabriel Scherer, who is somewhere around here, as well as my advisor, Armando Solilizama. If you have programmed in a language that is not Haskell, you have likely seen effects. You might have mutable states or exceptions. Perhaps you've even seen something that's more exotic. Well, exotic no more, for with the findings I present you today, we can have any effect in almost any language. One such effect is non-determinism. Choose three, four. It does not return three. It does not return four. It actually returns both. It splits the world and returns one in each branch. Can you name a language that can do this? John. 234 times 256 returns any and all of 15, 18, 20, 24. And it, we have this running. This is a completely normal Java program. We don't do a special pre-pass to transform the program. We don't have a special compiler. It's just normal Java code. Another effect, a bit trickier, is delimited control or delimited continuations. The way this works, I want you to focus on that shift statement and then think about the stuff that happens after. It multiplies the result by two. So what shift does is it takes that stuff happens after, multiplies it by two, and it moves it inside the body. And so here, that happens twice. So we do that multiplication by two twice. And so the reset block returns 21, and the entire expression returns 22. Now, this may sound like a bit of an obscure esoteric effect, but it's actually quite useful. We saw one application of it about 30 minutes ago in the last talk, but here's another one. If I have a traversal, this traversal calls some function foo with one and with two, and at some point, foo calls shift. That actually takes the traversal on the outside of this function and moves it to the inside. So now foo is in control of traversal, and this traversal has become an iterator. Can you name a language that has this? Yes, I heard Java, and that is correct. We have this running. This is, again, a completely normal Java program. So we can do any monadic effect, call CC, processing programming. In direct style, we do not need to rewrite a program with callbacks. We do not need do notation, which basically is callbacks, as if it was built into the language. We can do this in any language with exceptions in state. But there are two catches, which I'll explain later. The way this works, it's been known for a while, since Volinsky in 1994, that if you have the limited control, you can use that to get any monadic effect in direct style. So oh, the limited control is the mother of all monads. This is great news if your language has the limited control. I can name two such languages. So Scala has it, as well as Racket and other schemes. Luckily, in that same paper, Felinsky showed that you can implement the limited control with mutable states and ordinary continuations, call CC. So this is great news for the languages that have call CC. I can again name a couple. Ruby used to have it. They took it out. And SML, some implementations of SML have this. In this work, we replace call CC with exceptions and now we can, this really opens the floodgates as to what languages we can do this in. All your favorite languages. <laughs> to do this, our linchpin is thermometer continuations, a replay-based implementation of the limited control using exceptions in state. The name comes from this picture. There's my thermometer. As a warm-up, we're going to do replay-based non-determinism which shows you many of these ideas. And actually, in the paper, we show how this is a special case of thermometer continuations. What language to present this in? We need a language with exceptions in states. Since this is ICFP, we're using SML. The easiest case of non-determinism is choosing between two options, only one choice. If you look at this choose block, then it needs to return here in twice, 15 and 18. 
we have no language mechanism that we can use to capture anything inside that function. So to get 15 to 18, we need to run this twice. One chime, choose two words, turn five, the other six. And so this is how we implement it. We have a single bit saying whether it's the first time or not. On the first time, choose two words, turn the first option, else the second option. And the function that captures with the non-determinism, with non-determinism two, will set first time to true, run it, set first time to false, run it again. And so in this expression, we get 15 and 18. To scale that up, here is a program that has, it has multiple choices in different branches, choosing more than two options. There are five possible paths to this function, and so we're going to need to run it five total times, each time taking a different path. So we need to go from one bit of state to represent the path to many. And please welcome the two trademark stacks of this presentation, past and future. The first time we run this, choose will always take the left branch, take the first option. We record this in the path. These two choices are now a path index. They tell us which path we've gone through this function. We now increment the path index, saying next time, go right to the second choice. When we replay, the old path becomes a new future. And we, we replay it again, following the, this future. This time, we take the second path. We again increment the path index. We're out of choices at the bottom choice, so we backtrack. This time, we go right to the first choice. We'll pass to the new future, and we enter a third branch. We have not seen this choose in the else branch before, so once again, we choose left the first time. And continuing this mechanism, across five replays, we've explored all five branches. So there are a couple catches that you might have noticed. One is that we replay your function, and this can blow up your function quadratically in the number of choices. But we'll show some benchmarks later on that this is actually still runnable. But there's another thing. Suppose you wanted to do an effect before a choice, like print something. This would now run twice in each replay. And so, you cannot use any effects that are native to language. But who needs native effects? I'm about to show you how to get simulated effects, any effects you want. Behold, thermometer continuations. So what is what thing I just showed you have to do with continuations? Well, let's look at this example. So right as you're running the choose, look at the stuff that's going to happen after it, multiplying by three, that's continuation. That continuation happens twice, once with five and once with six. So we need to run this continuation twice, and we want some way of capturing and duplicating this continuation. Well, in the non-determinism, the first time we called this just by, like, we're in the middle of the execution already. We've finished it by returning a value. But the second time, we need another copy of this multiply thing by three, and for that, we replay the program. So actually, this non-determinism construction is kind of a stealthy manipulation of continuations. And we generalize this to capture any continuation. So here's a block. It's two effective functions returning three and seven. Now focus on this shift. What's going to happen after this shift? It's going to add all three results from these effects. So this is a continuation. It's the what will happen after having already run one of this function. We're in the middle of the function now. And I claim that we can represent this state with two things. One is with the values that we've already returned. And the other is with the function itself. So these two things put together represent the current state in the middle of this function, the current continuation. And so a thermometer continuation is just those two things. It is this recording of everything that's happened to this point, along with the function itself. And here's how we run them. So suppose that I want to invoke this continuation with five. So I want, that sh I want to run this thing, and I want shift to return five, and then a computation will proceed from there. So I take this recording, and I'm going to append five to it, so we'll use it later. And now I stick my thermometer into the function, and we begin executing. 
As we see each effect, we don't do that effect. We use the recorded value. And we record it again for, in case we need to capture another continuation. Now, at this point, we've dug deep into the execution in the middle of the function. And so the current state, we have recreated the continuation that we we're trying to capture. This is the state we were looking for. And now we make this shift return 5 instead of entering, and we get the expected result of 15. This is the ingredient. We are now ready for full shift and reset. As evidenced by the previous slide, shift is going to have to do something different depending on whether we're currently in a replay or if it's the first time running. So here's this example, two, next, two shifts sequentially. We enter the past and future. As we begin executing this, we enter the first shift. This is our first time running. So we need to capture the continuation as a thermometer continuation. We copy the current function as well, as well as the stack of recorded values, which is currently empty. And now, later on, the result of this shift is going to become the, the result of the entire set block. So we're going to throw an exception to transfer control. I just did that now in order to make things simpler. Now let's focus on the body of the shift function. Well, we're invoking this capture continuation twice, so let's play this, this thermometer continuation. And this time, we're invoking it with three. Now when we enter the function, we see the shift. Say, OK, we're in a replay, so that, we need, that shift needs to return a three. And now we're deeper into the function, because we invoke the continuation. Now we need to capture another thermometer continuation. The current state and function are recorded and saved at L. And again, again eventually, we're going to transfer control to this reset. So let's simplify. OK? So here we are currently, this is our stack, now we enter L, and we do this again. This time, we go all the way through the execution, we've already done both shifts, and so we get 15 as a result of this run. So we return to the previous shift with 15. The next thing runs similar, returns 18. This returns to the first shift, getting 15 to 18. Other branches of 20 and 24, and the final result is 15, 18, 20, 24. This, by the way, is an example of how you do non-determinism in terms of the limited control. And you can generalize this to any monad using Flinsky's construction. So obviously, this has some efficiency problems. You might have noticed, to get the first value, we already need to do three replays. And in total, we need to do seven replays, even though there are only four paths if we were through this non-deterministic function. The non-determinist construction will only use four, but here we use seven. We do fix that in the paper. Now, what we don't see here is the practical worst case. So maybe you don't care about quadratic theoretical blowup, but if you have a very long-running computation before you call a shift for a choose, you might replay this long-running computation many times. But we do have a benchmark in which doing things with this way with three plays is actually reasonably efficient. This is N Queens. This is everyone's favorite example of a non deterministic program. The problem is to place n queens on an n by n chessboard, as in this paper, as in this picture with n equals eight, such that no two queens are attacking each other. So we implemented this a very large number of times. Obviously, if you are willing to implement a backtracking search, then it can be very fast in two seconds. But what's, it's much simpler if we have a built-in non-determinism. So you can just say, give me the place in the next queen, and we'll just branch there, and not have to do your own backtracking search. So with replay based on determinism, we're only three and a half times slower. Now, as I mentioned before, our thermometer continuations are doing more replays, so it's twice as slow. But with the optimizations in the paper, uh, we got that back down to be the same as replays based on determinism. And so this is not that bad. We're, but SML of NJ does have call CC, which, and it's very efficient. So if you want non determinism than SML and J, you're still better off using call CC. But OCaml, on the other hand, it's a faster overall, but it does not have call CC. Again, we're three times slower than the manual backtracking search. But the al an alternative is, well, Oleg has a special OCaml runtime called DeLimCC, 
with limited control, which is not that efficient. And so if you want delimited control, at least for this example, we are three times faster than delimcc. Milton is another implementation of SML, whole program optimizing. We did not implement thermometer continuation. We implement replay based on determinism. It's four times slower. Milton does have call CC, but unlike SML and J, it's not a very fast call CC. And so you're once again three times faster than the built-in call CC, even though we do a ton of replays and they don't do any. And finally, just for fun, what if you had non-determinism that's built into your language? So we've found a few languages that have built-in non-determinism. We are, so DNU Prolog is slower than any of these. SWI Prolog is much slower still. And we also implemented it in a language called Curry, functional logic programming, which is just not on the charts. So in many contexts, even though we do all this replay, because the replays are so fast and lightweight using exceptions and states, in some cases we are still the fastest game in, in town for getting some of these exotic effects. I encourage you to read the paper. We do a, a lot more there. So I, didn't, I did not cover how we do nested shifts and nested resets in this talk. It's a small modification. We explained our optimizations. We refused the model continuations together with Linsky's construction. And that shows how the non determinism construction I gave you is a special case of model continuations fused with Linsky's construction. So someone tried to prove a long time ago that what we did today is impossible. He proved that accepting the state cannot macro express call CC which we can't, it looks like we just did. But actually we explained why that result is very weak and is not what we just did. So we can still get these. We also have a correctness proof of the non determinism construction. And of course, more benchmarks uh, in different monads. Right. You can check out our code at www.thermalcontinuations.com. And thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, so I think one question popping up here um, is by Ken. Uh, I'm still worried about the performance in large probabilistic models. Can you use memorization to reduce replay overhead? Uh, yes. So I lied slightly when I said no native effects. We have no problems with memoization. Any observationally pure benign uh, native effect into memoization is A OK. Okay, thanks. Um, the implementation is based on an unsafe cast. Uh, is there a way to avoid such a cast? Uh, yes. So I did not discuss in the talk, but in the paper, we use unsafe cast. And we have not found a way to get around this. There are type safe implementations of a universal type. Um, so the, originally, the original Flinsky paper also used unsafe.cast, and then they fixed it to not use unsafe.cast. Well, because of our replay, we cannot use the same fix. So we have not yet found a way to not use unsafe.cast or some form of dynamic typing. OK. Um, do you have any other examples besides the end queen? Yes. Yeah, so in the paper, or, in the, or rather in the, in the appendix of the full version on archives, uh, we have several parsing examples. Uh, most interestingly, we have a monadic parser in the state T with list monad based on a classic paper of Meyer and Hutton. And so yes, we can write a very, we can basically take this very beautiful monadic parsing code from the paper and just transcribe it into SML or Java or anything. Okay, uh, maybe just uh, one uh, follow up question on that. Um, something like concurrent ML, would that be possible to implement on top of your, of your library? Um, well, you can implement concurrent ML in terms of call CC. If you enclose your entire program in a reset block, you can implement call CC in terms of shift and reset. And you, so, therefore, you should be able to do it. Uh, it might not be efficient, but it, it would work. Okay. Let's uh, thank the speaker. <laughs>